Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good day, wherever you are. Um, welcome to our webinar today about the uh, historic first uh, amateur radio operations from space. My name is uh, Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, it's my call sign. And I'm the uh, international chair for the ARIS Working Group, as well as the ARIS USA Executive Director. We're so excited to have this uh, meeting today and to uh, have as our guest speaker, Richard Garriott, call sign uh, W5KWQ, for him to talk about his dad's mission, uh, Owen Garriott's flight, uh, W5LFL on STS-9. I also want to thank um, uh, my co-moderator, for this uh, activity, which is Will Marchant, as well as our web technical support team, our web webinar technical support team, Jim Reed and Gordon Scannell. And so uh, let me let me uh, turn it over to Richard uh, for his introductions, and then uh, we'll move into the discussion. Richard? Well, well uh, thank you, Frank, Will, Jim, uh, everybody uh, for uh, uh, inviting me here. It's, it's really a, a, an, a pleasure and an honor to uh, get a chance to talk to you about this. You know, um, uh, it's uh, interesting. Um, uh, I thought what I might do is sort of just uh, give a little bit of background about my dad pre-flight, uh, because when I grew up, um, you know, of course, growing up as the uh, child of an astronaut outside the front gates of NASA is already kind of an unusual upbringing uh, in any circumstance, uh, especially because all your neighbors are also either astronauts or NASA engineers involved in putting people into space. But in particular with my dad, um, ham radio operations was always a big part of his life. I mean, long before I was uh, walking on this earth, my dad and his granddad, who was the original W5KWQ, um, uh, who lived up in Enid, Oklahoma, uh, they decided to become uh, ham radio operators, uh, both uh, so they could keep in touch as they moved to more distant uh, locations on the uh, here in the United States. But also it became really clear the joy they got out of it, uh, you know, uh, in connecting with people really all over the world. And when I would come in my dad's office as a child, uh, my dad is uh, was a very Spock-like workaholic, to be to be honest. He was, uh, he, when he came home from his long day at NASA, he would go into his long evenings uh, in his office. And, uh, you know, his, the main part of his office had the, you know, traditional desk and file cabinets and, uh, but except that his desk was always covered with NASA experiments, things like, uh, uh, you know, a photo multiplier tube with a camera lens and a telescope eyepiece. It was really a night vision scope long before there was night vision. So it was great fun to get a chance to play with all of his techno toys. But chief among them in his office is there were a double bifold doors that would open up to what in a normal house would be used as a closet. But in this case, it was his ham rig. And so not only do we have, uh, of course, antennas um, uh, off of the side of our house and around the house, but of course, uh, we, had a, a, we had quite a sizable amount of equipment uh, uh, there in the, in the office. And, and one thing, one thing I, I, I skipped over that I meant to mention um, was uh, kind of how and why my dad was ultimately selected as an astronaut. I mean, my, da my dad was in the third group of astronauts selected. That was the first group of scientist astronauts, the first and second group of astronauts were all military test pilots. And then when they decided they really wanted scientists to also maybe go do some sampling on the surface of the moon, uh, they uh, put out a search and that was the one my dad joined. But the, the reason why my dad decided to apply to be an astronaut also is directly related to ham radio operations. My dad, uh, previous to NASA, was actually in a Stanford professor studying both upper ionospheric physics and specifically radio wave propagation. And so he had a laboratory there that was regularly doing things like calculating skip distances based upon physics profiles of the ionosphere to look at bouncing signals or multiple bounces even to see how far around the planet you could communicate. And so when Sputnik was launched, no surprise, my dad's uh, you know lab there was particularly well outfitted for getting a chance to listen into those first beep beeps beep beeps coming from the very first um, uh, uh, artificial satellite, and so that really is what inspired him to 
about space, about the fact that radios in space were going to be a big deal. Um, the about then is when he became. I don't remember. I don't even actually know if it was before or after that. He became a ham alongside my granddad. Um, but obviously that uh, became really just a deep part of his story. Um, uh, you know, and 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 it, and for me as a child growing up in the house, that ham radio was on. You know, at the very least every weekend. Uh, while we were, he was leading and we were as kids often sitting on his knee uh, as he would make contacts around the globe. So uh, long before his flight on STS-9, uh, he was a, a, a true enthusiast and a true scientist in uh, the technologies of ham radio. Yeah, that's an amazing story, uh, Richard. You know, and your dad, um, you know, talked to several of us about uh, flying HF experiments uh, as part of um, a uh, ham radio activity. We've got it. We've got an HF antenna on space station, but we have not utilized it um, uh, for one reason or another. And still want to uh, follow up on his legacy on on that and try to make that happen because. Uh, you know, when you're in the middle of the ionosphere, things change a lot. So uh, it's very interesting uh, experiment that uh, we have not done, but we would like to do in the future. Uh, you know, and Frank, if you don't mind me ripping on things we didn't actually talk about previous to this call, uh, one, one more thing I'd just like to mention just about, uh, uh, you know, sort of my indoctrination into uh, radio wave propagation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was really, I was a BC student in school, to be honest, but I was a, but I was a rocking a competitor in science fair. So I, I, that was really where I shined was in these competitions. But my junior and senior year projects was wave propagation with computer analysis. And uh, this was even before personal computers, this was on a teletype in the 19, 1978, 1979. Yeah. It was my dad who would sit down with me and he would talk about, you know, he was the leading, one of the leading scientists for ionospheric profiles. Mm -hmm. And he understood the physics of, you know, a single ray being traced, you know, through that space. And then I was already a young computer hacker. And so I could sit down and write code in basic to do ray tracing. And so I would literally, based on a profile and the physics calculations my dad would give me, I made some of the very first ever ray tracing programs that existed, in, you know, in, back in the day on teletypes that uh, the, to calculate skip distances for ham radios. And yeah, so uh, anyway, cool. so my indoctrination was deep and uh, and at a pretty young age. That That is pretty amazing. I did not know that about you. I I just, you know, I know you worked on the teletype like I did in the early 70s. Um, uh, and, and and that led you into the whole uh, video game industry, which is absolutely amazing. Um, but that's that's really neat. Well, well, let's circle back to your dad's flight. Um, I've got a couple uh, items I wanted to show people uh, as part of that. And so uh, let me uh, share my screen and just have a quick discussion on this. All right. Okay, so you all should see my screen now. So basically going back to um, your dad's flight, um, you know, this week is when uh, uh, STS-9 uh, was on orbit from November 28th till tomorrow, uh, 40 years ago. And uh, Owen was the first astronaut to talk to hams from space. And, uh, and, and really, this was transformational. What he did was transformational in that before he did that, the only, one, the only ones that could really talk to astronauts in space were a few people basically the Capcoms in mission control or a head of state like the president or some other president, if it was a, uh, you know, a European activity, you know, like Germany or something like that. Those were the only people that could really talk to astronauts. When he started talking to astronauts, he basically allowed the whole public to be able to be engaged in space. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to see the videos on television, you know, uh, in those days, but, you know, to be able to hear the the voices from space directly and to talk was totally transformational. And 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 frankly, he wanted to do this um, also as a STEM. It was called STEM back then, but to engage students and get them interested in science, technology, engineering, and those kind of activities. 
and you know what he did also was um uh through what he did with that transform transformational change uh we started uh, through his flight and then beyond doing these school contacts which we're doing today um, in the early days, friends and family connections, this was the only way that the crew could talk to their families on shuttle or uh, on Mir. And then uh, in the beginnings of International Space Station until the IP phone was up. And then, you know, we did this uh, this uh, deployment uh, with Bill MacArthur and, and, and uh, the cosmonauts uh, of deploying this, this uh, uh, spacesuit called SuitSat. And we had to work with NASA and, and Russia and uh, the Russian space agencies to come up with a safety to make that happen. And that resulted in the deployment of satellites routinely on space station, the, you know, the CubeSats and a whole bunch of other things. So, you know, this 40 years, this 40 year anniversary allows us all to think about and to celebrate all of the, the uh, contributions over the years. So, um, let me just say that uh, before Owen flew, he did a little video. I need to make sure, and I got to stop the sharing and make sure I sound on. Um, he did a little video to describe the uh, on orbit station. Yep, it's sharing. Okay, so. Um, nope, that's the wrong one. Sorry about that. Start that again. Okay, so let's uh, let me uh, get to the chart, basically the video, I should say. So this is uh, W five LFL Owen Garriott describing the STS nine Hammond radio station setup, and let me just say that the radio he's talking about is the one on the right hand side of this screen. Before the flight. Gary had explained the station that he planned to use. This was a, has a five watt output and is connected uh, via a cable here that we can see running up to an overhead window. And uh, this is about a two foot square antenna in a little dish. And that antenna will radiate then outward above the spacecraft. And of course we will want to make sure the spacecraft then is oriented in such a way that that antenna is pointed in some direction uh, toward the earth. And then we can communicate from this transceiver out through the antenna and back again. Now we have another little box here which connects, interconnects uh, several uh, different elements. First of all, it interconnects to my headset. And so I have a little lightweight headset, which is just like the one I use for all of my communications on board uh, the Columbia and Space Lab. As a matter of fact, I really don't even have to change headsets. I just uh, disconnect the cable from my Space Lab uh, unit and plug it into this little interface box and it connects my standard headset into the transceiver. Now we mentioned some logs a little bit ago. We need to log or make a record of all of the transmissions that both I make and signals that I receive. And I have a little, a small portable. Trans or a, a tape recorder on which that is done. And so I will have this Velcroed or attached to the transceiver and I will turn it on at the time I begin the transmissions and then it'll simply keep a verbal record for me of everything I say on the transceiver and everything I hear on the receiving portion of the unit. And uh, that is really all of the equipment that we need. So what'd you think of that, Richard? Yeah, that's awesome. You know, uh, it's funny. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I've ever even really seen that clip. I, you told me about it, but I'm not sure I've, I've seen it, at least not as an adult. Uh, and, and a weird thought went through my head, by the way, that is my dad also happens to be the first person who ever had facial hair when they flew into space, by the way. That's a, just a, a, that's... An, odd, an odd statistic. Uh, but yeah, but uh, uh, but as you know, Frank, I actually have that radio right here. Look, here is the you know Columbia flight use uh, uh, radio right here that you just saw uh, on that uh, video. Uh, that uh, you know, so it's a, an honor to now be able to be uh, the the caretaker, shall I say, of uh, of this radio that was the first to transmit from space. Yeah, that's very good. And um, you know, there is a, just for everyone's benefit, uh, there is one of the radios. Actually, the picture I have here is the is the one that's at the visitor center. 
Ah. at the Kennedy Space Center. There's a nice <laughs> little exhibit in there about that. The other thing um, I would like to show, and I need to turn off my, um, the virtual background. my background, otherwise it doesn't work very well. While you're doing that, Frank, I wanted to ask Richard, um, the recorder and the tapes that your dad mentioned for the Q QSOs, do you know what happened to those? Are those still yeah, around? Uh, or? Uh, yeah, they are still around. I have both the little mini cassette recorder and the mini cassettes. And so um, uh, they're at my home office, but uh, those still exist. And uh, I've pl I played the tapes uh, most recently three or four years ago. And, you know, they're showing a little bit of age, but there uh, there are still uh, there are still record recordings on them. So he, he was very diligent. And it, well, in fact, something you, you, you may or may not know, I'm not sure if you guys might have been involved with this, which is, you know, he was also trying to make um, live logs, logging all of his contacts. But he knew there were a lot more people calling out to him than he could respond to by voice as he's quickly as possible jotting down notes and responding as uh, whenever he can by voice. And so what he did with those tapes after he got back to the ground is he himself spent you know, weeks and weeks listening to those tapes volume high to, to make sure he, anyone he could suss out that was you know, could be heard on that tape trying to reach him, he then sent them all a contact card too. So he, he, he was really, he really worked hard to try to make sure he, that, that all of the people that, that really tried to reach out and had any, any, any chance of reaching him uh, knew that he had heard them. Yeah, he was very diligent in anything he did. And that's why he was an astronaut. That's why he did what he did. Very historic. Um, you know, I did want to mention, um, uh, and I've got a little show and tell also. I did want to mention, um, you know, he showed that window antenna. And the reason we had the window antenna is because we didn't have an RF feed through. And uh, an RF feed through is very important because you'd like to have the antenna outside. Uh, it's the limited visibility, as he, as he mentioned. Um, he tried, you know, he was uh, pushing really hard on his Skylab mission to actually fly amateur radio. And ARL... And AMSAT both worked together very diligently to try to make that happen, but it ended up being the RF feed through being the problem. So uh, the innovator, the innovative amateur radio community figured out, well, we could do this on the shuttle with um, with with a, a window mount antenna. And by the way, uh, you sh saw that window mount antenna, and this is actually it. Uh, hopefully, you all can see this, but. Um, this has got a protective covering on it. And um, those that want to know, the it's an end connector on the back for the hams with a, a BNC uh, connection. And so worked really well in the window of, uh, of both his flight on STS-9 and Tony England's flight on STS-51F. And then we went and, to side windows beyond and that. Then, and then Frank, just so for uh, my edification too, the reason why it's in that aluminum housing also is both as a collector and reflector, I presume, to make sure that your energy is headed towards earth. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. So, okay. Do you know how uh, much, what that window was made out of? Did you, do you know? Oh, well, that, that was a big issue too. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I assume you, you attenuate something through that, that window because it's not just regular glass, right? It's, it's uh, lead, It's there's lead in there, yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so hard to yes. Uh, that all was, you know, there was a lot of work. The the folks, the Motorola Amateur Radio Club, um, mm -hmm. Kai Siwiak and, 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 and Lou McFadden from our team, W5DID, they all uh, worked very, very hard to 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 uh, make sure that it would work in space. Uh, specifically, they they got into the Space Shuttle Enterprise. If you all remember, the Enterprise was the one that was used for landing tests. Uh, they got in there because it had the same windows and everything. And they were able to do all of their testing on that. And then they got an opportunity to do it in Columbia. So, uh, so yeah, it was a challenge. And, um, you know, you had to reorient the vehicle so that the antenna is pointing down. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So I've got another couple uh, videos I wanted to show. Um, let me get uh, back on the screen share here. And so um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, well, this is 
want to go beyond that one. Let's talk a little bit about the first contact. So, you know, let me just say, let me set the stage here is that months before Owen's flight, there was a huge buzz internationally about, about being able to hear somebody from space and be able to talk to somebody from space. And everyone was coming up with different ways to, to communicate with them, to, to, to raise their chances of being able to talk to someone in space. And uh, those that are hams know that we were operating and we still are operating on FM. FM uses this thing called the capture effect, which basically uh, the physics of that is that the the loud the uh, the strongest signal is the one that will get through. So if you got two or three signals that are about the same, you're going to get noise, if you will, or little blurbs, and that's what Richard was talking about of of trying to uh, understand uh, the specific individuals that are calling because you're getting little syllables here or there. So. Um, so Lance Collister was the first one to actually make the contact. So let's let's go to the video and you can uh, you can see what happened. And and actually that's a picture of Owen uh, doing uh, ham radio on on the Space Lab mission. On orbit day three, excitement peaked among hams all over the world. Also look at the ancient technology. And then amateur radio's man in space went on the air. This is W5LFL in Columbia. W5LFL in Columbia orbiting the Earth at an altitude of 135 nautical miles. Passing over the U.S. West Coast and calling CQ. W5LFL on SPS9, WA1JXN, WA1 Japan, X-ray Norway, WA1JXN, Frenchtown, Montana, standing by. Hello, W1JXN, WA1 Juliet, X-ray November. This is W5LFL. Uh, you're our first contact from uh, orbit. Uh, WA1 Juliet, X-ray November. Uh, how do you read, over? It was quite a thrill. I, I was very surprised when he came back and said that uh, quite clearly that I was the first contact from orbit. This is WB5LMJ, Whiskey Bravo 5, Lima, Mike, Juliet in Lawton, Oklahoma, calling the Space Shuttle Columbia. KZ-17 calling W5LFL, Kilo Alpha 7, Kilo Alpha 7, this is KZ-17, KZ-17 calling W5LFL, this is Kilo Alpha 7, W5LFL, this is W5IU, Whiskey 5, India, Uniform. Amazing, isn't it, Richard? Yeah, that's really astounding. You know, and uh, you know, even if uh, you know you had all been doing hams around right that time too, but the just overwhelming, you know, uh, number of people that were all involved, and I, I had never been prior to any hamventions or things, you know, conventions where you know anywhere like this number of hams all were participating in one thing before. So, yeah, you know, for me, even as a, as a youngster, that was pretty overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And and um, let me just say a couple things. Um, first off, I want to give credit to the ARL because this video was done by them. And our, the narrator of it is uh, a, a good friend of ours for many, many years, uh, Roy Neal, uh, K6DUE, who you know worked uh, in the space industry as a NBC science correspondent for many years. And he was really our leader, uh, the leader of all of this activities, uh, you know, working with AMSAT and ARL. Uh, to try to get amateur radio on board and then to keep it on board. And not only that, but, you know, he inspired in me uh, the, the the vision of making sure we follow NASA as, uh, or not follow NASA, follow human spaceflight as it moves from vehicle to vehicle, starting with shuttle with, with your dad, um, and then Mir, and then International Space Station, which you got to, to uh, participate in, and then, and then uh, beyond that, and where we go in the future. 
Um, and, uh, also I, wanna... I can't remember. I can't remember if you have a video clip where we're going to talk about uh, King Hussein. Is that already is that coming up in yours, or or is this a good time for me to talk? I... You why don't you talk about it? Well, because what, what I was going to mention, you know, in addition to what I'll call the general public, the you know the anyone from around the globe, I would argue that it's also had great you know political and scientific reach. Also, there are people that my dad corresponded with by ham radio from space from all walks of life on all continents. And and a lot of those people were people that he may not have known nearly as well before, but now they had this new extra bond. And whether that meant that they were, you know, a ham radio operator from Australia that might meet up sometime at a convention in the future, or my poster child example is King Hussein of Jordan, who is also a ham radio operator, and they managed to talk to each other from space. And so that meant a lot to both of them. And then they you went out of their way to, you know, meet in the physical, you know, face-to-face -face world, uh, you know, after that. And so I, I actually think that ham in general connects people from around the globe, but the the uh, amateur radio in space, uh, I think, has had a very special, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, political component or global connections uh, 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 at all levels that it has really helped with. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, ham radio is international. That's part one. And, you know, and, and from a human spaceflight perspective, as well as just from a satellite perspective, we have to work internationally to make these things happen. It uh, It is uh, pretty cool. Now, I do have, I could I could show that video if you want. I do have the thing I can say. It's up to you. Oh, you say, muted. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, stay with your program, but I just, uh, okay. for me, it was right. an interesting one. Yeah. Well, I, I I did want to show one other video um, uh, before we move on, and and that is, uh, you, you talked about, you know, the people from around the world and, and things, but also, uh, and I mentioned earlier, friends and family. So your dad didn't uh, shy away from that at all either. So I've got a little clip on that. I, I want to show you and give you a you can give some reflections on that. All right. Space Labo and Gary had also found time to put oh, need to need to share your screen. Radio. He talked to more. Thank you. <laughs> I thought I was still sharing. That's that's right. I disconnected it. I'll start that one over. Okay, let's start it over. When he wasn't working in Space Lab, Owen Gary had also found time to put on a spectacular demonstration of amateur radio. He talked to more than 300 stations all over the world, and some of the contacts were special. To his son, standing by at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, and he spoke to his mother while flying over Enid, Oklahoma. Oh, hi, son. Hello, mother. How are you this afternoon? Glad to talk to you. So, Richard, I'm not sure if you've seen that one either. Have you? I no. have not. No, okay. I'm going to I'm gonna have to get some of these videos from you afterwards. But uh, uh, but no, and uh, again, uh, that was my grandmother, of course, but uh, it was my grandfather who was really just, uh, again, the partner ham with my dad uh, on, on a, such a regular basis. But also, uh, you know, my brother and I, my brother Robert and I, um, when he was up also, we went over to the NASA, the Johnson Space Center ham shack, and uh, uh, reached up to him as well from uh, uh, there at Johnson. So it was it was it was it was a cool way to get a chance to participate in the flight for for all of us. Yeah, very good. Uh, let me just say a couple things. One is that uh, this video, which is called Amateur Radio's Newest Frontier, um, is which was generated 40 years ago. That's why the images aren't, you know, 1080p or 4K or whatever. <laughs> so, but but they're pretty cool. Um, and, and there, it's on our YouTube uh, website. You can you can find it on the Eris website, but we can also get you the clips. Um, the other thing I did want to mention is that um, if anyone is interested in asking Richard any questions, please put them in the chat, and Jim will uh, Jim Reed will uh, will uh, will read them off as we we get to that portion. Okay. So um, your dad's flight ended um, on December eighth. Um, you know it it's it's amazing. 
you know, you holding the radio and me holding the antenna, knowing that, you know, these objects were in space 40 years ago, operationally, if you will. And uh, it's, it's, it's really uh, fantastic. But I wanted to turn the turn it over to you for a bit to talk about your experiences because you got the you got the experiences to fly and we'd like to hear more about uh, about uh, your background and what happened there. Yeah, you know, um, um, for me, you know, as a young kid, uh, you know, growing up with a, you know, you already know, of course, my dad was an astronaut, but my mother was uh, a naturalist and an artist. And, uh, and, and, if, and to be honest, it was really my mother taking me outside to study the life cycles of insects that really made me really want to be an explorer and, uh, uh, you know, instilled that level of curiosity uh, and artistic, uh, the artistic side of me. And of course, I got the technology side from my dad. And that led me into my, my background, which is as a video game developer. So I, was a, I, I would argue you know, video games are the quintessential high tech art. And I had a high tech dad and an artist mom and thus... Uh, and being at the right age when personal computers came out, you know, worked out well for me. But at about that same time, right as I started into making video games, I was at the NASA doctor because our whole family would go to NASA for uh, our medical care. And one of the doctors there, seeing that I was uh, getting to the age of about 13 when I needed glasses, said, you know, I hate to break it to you, but you are no longer eligible to be a NASA astronaut. And he just flippantly threw that out because most people aren't astronauts, so it's no big deal. And But for me, I was like crushed. I was like, wait, 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 wait. You're kicking me out of the club that my dad, both of my left and right hand neighbor's parents, and you know, a significant percentage of everybody in my neighborhood is a part of this club in one way or another. And before I'm even old enough to think about it, you just kicked me out. And so um, uh, I was I was really honestly upset about it. That's But that's also what solidified my passion to get myself into space. And uh, and so at the age of 13, I resolved, you know, if I can't go by the NASA rules, I'm gonna make my own space agency, and uh, which you don't do much about at the age of 13. But at the age of 15, I was writing video games. And a couple of years after that, I was making some pretty good money. And so I began to invest in helping to open up commercial human spaceflight. And for the first decade, I did that with the smartest people I knew, mostly NASA astronauts and engineers, who are often leaving NASA to go try to do things privately, uh, specifically trying to open up commercial human space flight. And that first decade was honestly a bust. And to me, the lesson was, you know, these guys, these, these astronauts might be great military test pilots and they might be great scientists or physicists. That does not necessarily mean they're either good entrepreneurs nor good politicians to be able to persuade NASA to allow civilians, for example, to fly on a space shuttle. And, uh, you know, the nearest I came was a company called um, uh, SpaceHab. And we actually did produce, uh, that was a, I was one of the first investors in SpaceHab that produced a, uh, uh, a pressurized cabin that would sit in the back of the shuttle payload bay. And it was full of additional research uh, laboratory space. And, uh, but when we, the original business plan also showed that it could be outfitted as a double-decker bus and take 40 civilians on the shuttle into space, which after we got this built and started negotiating with NASA, NASA's going like, no, 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 no happy to have the experiments we're really not going to take civilians and so i was like rats you know so close and yet so far and and it actually wasn't until i joined the place that i'm sitting here right now so I'm, I'm sitting here in the explorers club headquarters in new york city i'm the current sitting president of the explorers club by the way we have a radio room here in the explorers club that for you know uh, uh, tens of years almost 100 years was used to, to contact uh, uh, field researchers while they were in the field that I'm hoping to uh, help you get some help from you guys to help revitalize and um, modernize. And um, uh, uh, but when I when I joined the Explorers Club in the late '90s, is when I met teams of people who were used to opening up frontiers, whether they're the Arctic or the tops of mountains or the deep oceans. And I got involved in helping build and operate technology and companies to open a lot of those frontiers. And of course, high on my list was always space. And so uh, here, here or near the club is where we nucleated things like the XPRIZE, Zero-G, Space Adventures. And ultimately, Space Adventures is the company that flew the first seven private citizens into space, including myself. And I was actually originally slated to be the first. Uh, but that's when the internet stock market crashed and I had to sell that first seat to a guy named Dennis Tito, who became actually the first private citizen to fly in space. I had to build another company, sell another company, uh, ultimately in 2008, when there was another financial crisis. 
was when I managed to uh, uh, hold it together long enough to make my own way into space. And, <clears throat> and you know, being my father's son and finally getting a chance to fly myself into space, you know, I um, was interested in doing a lot more than just having a vacation in space. I was really trying to make sure I did something that was very scientifically productive. Um, I would argue that I actually took on a as good or maybe even arguably heavier a workload than a lot of astronauts do just because I didn't have any red tape to loop through. You know, I could uh, move at a pretty high speed. I did a lot of commercial work for companies like uh, uh, DHL and uh, uh, and Seiko uh, watches. Um, but of course, I also had to do, wanted to, and to do, and you know, we, we felt I was almost an obligation to do ham radio in space. And uh, and so uh, I'm going to flip and share some of my slides now. Uh, hang on, here we go. Uh, there we go. So. Um, um, uh, and, and, and one of the things about it, by the way, was that I was also, I flew, I was flying in October also, but on uh, the 25th anniversary of, of my dad's uh, uh, space lab flight. And, and so, uh, you know, so when we were thinking about flying, you know, one of the first things was going like, well, you know, I don't want to be by now, since you guys have already had ham radios up on the space station for already for, you know, a decade. And so I was going like, what? I want to do something a little different. I want to at least um, improve, in some sense of the word, the state of the art. And that's when we all got together. And uh, 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 and the idea that I believe you all proposed was to take this up to the space station, which is a slow scan television device. And so uh, I had, you know, while my dad, you just saw his rig was the radio connected directly to you know his uh, headset, a cassette recorder, and the antenna? Um, I actually had a laptop also hooked up in that chain, and uh, the reason why that laptop was important is because even when I was not at the ham radio rig, I could set up slideshows to be broadcast from the laptop through the ham radio uh, slow scan uh, uh, capability. And so I took up things like this. I took up test patterns and eye tests and pirate flags, because here I am taking over the ISS or a picture of some ham to send from space, that sort of thing. But by the time I was finished, you know, I had made, in fact, I didn't actually know when I, before I flew, I forgot to make a note of how many contacts did my dad have. And after, after I realized how many people were interested in speaking from space, I was going like, wow, I don't want to let these people down. And so I became sort of manic about, uh, you know, uh, doing it as often as I could. So I got over 518 contacts over the 10 days I was doing it. There were thousands of the slow scan television images sent down. I even periodically would set that uh, slow scan television device uh, up at the windows to constantly send down selfies to people who might be uh, down below would could uh, uh, you know, get a direct link of a photograph of their uh, region of the of the earth from space. And uh, and then as I started making contacts, it's interesting that in my crew notebook, I had a page or two set aside for you know the uh, recording people's call signs. What I did not realize until it started happening live is the flood of people that would be there. Uh, in fact, uh, I mentioned to you, Frank, the other day that um, one time I was going to the bathroom in the middle of the night or the middle of Greenwich Mean Time night, you know, you never, you know, since the sunrises and sunsets happen so quickly there, you you see a, a lot of them. But I happened to be um, floating through past the ham radio, and I looked out the window, and in this case, I was above uh, Australia, and 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 the radio was on, so that if anybody was trying to contact up, I would hear them trying to call, but it was just kind of staticky, quiet there. Uh, but I just said, you know, I'm just curious if anybody's up listening. And I, I pressed the push to talk button on the uh, microphone and immediately like 10 people were right there. And it was like three o'clock in the morning in Australia. And, uh, you know, and it was just, it just was a sign to me about how enthusiastic even 25 years after that first contact, even 10 days or whatever many days it was into my own flight. Even at three o'clock in the morning on a night pass over Australia, where they knew that the crew would be asleep during this window, there were still people eagerly there to make contact. And so I, again, that, that just added to me sort of a sense of responsibility and, and excitement about getting a chance to speak to as many people as I could. And so after this first day of contacts, 
I started using the back pages, the back sides of pages in my crew, uh, man, my crew uh, 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 manual here <clears throat> to record more context day after day after day, and then more day after day after day, and then more day after day. And I've even reusing paper that I'd used for some other kind of stuff there with a big if on it. But um, but in the end, um, I just made, I made lots and lots and lots of contacts. But I but I have to confess, I screwed one up. And that was probably, to me, what was going to be the most important contact at all. It was with friends and family down in Austin, Texas. The uh, armadillo system across Texas had a repeater set up to uh, echo it all around the state of Texas. And they were set up on my own property. And I got tied up doing something else. And I arrived at the radio at two minutes late. And when you're traveling 17,210 miles an hour, two minutes is forever. And so I was already over the horizon, you know, by the time I got the radio uh, 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 spun up. And so uh, tragically, that that was the one that I missed. But in the end, as you guys have heard me say, you know, for me, ham radio on the International Space Station was simultaneously the most challenging thing I was involved with just because of the rapid pace and technical aspects that it really required but it was also the most rewarding just because you really did get a chance to speak with, speak with people around the world, students in schools. It was very obvious the uh, enthusiasm with which everybody on the ground was also participating. Uh, so it really was uh, truly, truly a joy. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm so proud and, and pleased to have gotten a chance to play my little piece now in this 40 years so far of amateur radio on the International Space Station. Thank you, uh, Richard. That was great. Uh, you know, Will Marchant mentioned this a little earlier. And I'll, I'll, I'll amplify it. Is that uh, you know you started you when you did the slow scan television activities, you really got everyone uh, truly spun up on that, and it remains today one of our most popular activities uh, with not just the ham community, but with uh, with educators and with uh, students all around the world. They're they're all with these very simple uh software defined radio dongles that they can put in their computers they can actually receive the signals directly so it's uh it's uh, really cool how all of that's happened and thank you for for making that happen for us oh no absolutely i have to play my part you know and it, it's just also just interesting how how quickly the technology continues to evolve you know you look at these well in fact when i was working on the ham station here at the explorers club you know we have the gear that goes all the way back to you know manual key morse code entry as the as the standard and um, uh, and everything that's happened since. Uh, but the fact you mentioned, for example, a dumb we can put in the back of a computer and hear it directly. Just it's just stunning how how much better it continues to get. Yep. All right. So I'm going to switch gears now a little bit. Uh, unless you had something else, Richard, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, our our celebration coming up. Uh, yes, absolutely. Well, do you, when do you want me to throw in? The oh, go ahead. Go for it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I knew so, I was uh, something. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's fascinating when I was over training in Moscow. Um, the gentleman that runs the amateur radio uh, uh, on the Russian side of the same you know, group of us uh, is a guy named Sergei Sambarov. And Sergei happens to be the great grandson of Tsiolkovsky, which uh, those of you who know space know that Tsiolkovsky is the guy that wrote the rocket equation and designed an enormous amount of things that are actually the way we do them in space before there ever were airplanes. And so just a, a, a real key figure and Sergei himself designs all the antennas on the uh, Soyuz and Mir and, you know, all their uh, current vehicles. And, uh, and he runs their amateur radio program. So he was very excited to meet me. He knew my dad already. He was a fan of my dad through because of amateur radio. And so we became fast friends uh, and colleagues, uh, still are, uh, uh, the, when, when, we were, when we were together in, in Russia. Um, but what you may not know is on the 40th anniversary of Sputnik, um, Sergei led a team of French, American, and Russian uh, youth and created Sputnik 2s. And so what I have right here behind me on this desk is one of the actual operational Sputnik 2s. And so they made four of them. Two of them were ultimately taken to the Mir space station and thrown into space. Two of them were remained at Sergei Sambarov's office and he gave me one of them. So one of them is right here. And these uh, one-third scale models of Sputnik um, broadcast the original Sputnik information plus some messages from the youth 
uh, on that 40th anniversary. So I'm going to take, uh, I have on uh, right here, uh, you know, a, a handheld radio, and I'm going to reach inside here and turn this on. And so that satellite is now transmitting on uh, 1458.15, uh, the messages that they recorded on this International Day of Space and the original Sputnik message. And so if you listen to it, it'll say it in English, French, other languages, Russian, of course. And uh, and then it actually has uh, the data, uh, the, the original recordings of Sputnik, plus its own data gathering to give modern uh, data that it broadcasts in space, specifically on ham frequencies. And so uh, anyway, it's a real pleasure to get a chance to work with the Russian side of ARES as well. Super talented, super enthusiastic people over there, uh, obviously building some great hardware. And um, uh, and so really, as you've already said a couple of times, this is really a global effort uh, that is really, I think, you know, brings people together despite the politics, despite the distances, you know, really around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it's important to recognize that, you uh, we wouldn't have been able to turn on the radio system on space station uh, 13 days after the first crew came on board if Sergey wasn't able to find some uh, antennas that were usable uh, in the FGB that we actually operated for for several years before we got into the service module and then ultimately in the Columbus module also. So, yeah, it's been a very close relationship amongst all of our regions uh, in ARIS internationally. So thank you for that. Anything else before we move uh, to the next uh, aspect. Okay. Yeah. So uh did want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, uh, the continuation of the celebration of 40th anniversary and all the accomplishments that have happened over the years. Um, and so um, let me uh, over here. Okay. So, um, I did want to talk a little bit about our 40th uh, anniversary celebration. We are planning uh, a celebration uh, in February, in late February, if, if people aren't aware of this. At this point, um, let me just say there's two things going to happen. One is our international face-to-face -face meeting, and there's some of the folks with Sergey Sambarov right in the middle, uh, if you will, of the in front of the Columbus module. Um, so the... the uh, ARIS International Face-to-Face -face Meeting will be happening. That's kind of a smaller get-together. But on the other side of this uh, is our 40th anniversary conference, which will be on the, uh, the 23rd and 24th of February, Friday and Saturday. Um, and uh, as part of that, we're going to have a dinner, a gala dinner on uh, on uh, Friday night, the 23rd, under the, Apollo, uh, the, the Saturn V uh, rocket, uh, which will be very cool. Uh, we are hosting this at the visitor center uh, at Kennedy Space Center. Um, and actually, we'll have a, a reception on the evening of the 22nd. Uh, we'll, we have exhibitors coming in um, and uh, we'll do the reception there. We have the conference, have the dinner. And, um, uh, you know, our intent is to, um, to, to really showcase what we have accomplished. So... Uh, we will be in the Center for Space Education, uh, which is sponsored by the Astronaut Memorial Foundation. It's uh, co-located with the uh, Visitor Center at the Kennedy Space Center. Really nice facility. We're we're splitting the uh, the big auditorium up, partially for um, for uh, exhibitors and then partially for the actual conference. And you know what we're we want to do here is we're inviting uh, several astronauts and Richard has agreed to come. So Richard will be at our, our conference. We're so excited to have you, Richard, uh, at that. Um, and, uh, and, and 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 uh, have astronaut experiences, what it was like on shuttle, what it was like on Mir, and what it was like on International Space Station. Some of the international challenges. When we first started working together, even on shuttle and then Mir, you know, it was, uh, you know, how that works when you get new people working together with different cultures. So we'll talk a little bit about that and and how we work through that and how we are such a you know phenomenal um, cohesive team after all of these years. Uh, we'll have a number of VIP keynote speakers, one of them being Richard, of course, and then panel sessions as shown. We you know one of the things we want to talk about is how we got to yes, you know, with uh, with uh, the STS nine mission with Owen Garriott's mission and actually change the whole 
way of being able to communicate uh, the world's ability to communicate with uh, astronauts in space. And, and, and Frank, let me let me, let me even just, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm curious to hear that story too from your side, because mm -hmm. having now been through the process of trying to take any experiments up to the International Space Station, that is not trivial. And uh, and especially if you're going to use energy and broadcast, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know a significant uh, uh, signals uh, that in theory could bounce around on other antennas or inside the, you know, the uh, could interfere with other activity going on on board the space station. I can only imagine how hard that would be to get clearance for. So anyway, <laughs> what what a great job! I know that you must have done, and so I, I at least look forward to hearing that story. Yeah, it's it's uh it's been a like you said it's a huge effort from a lot of people uh, around the world to make it happen. And yes, even today we're still dealing with uh, RF concerns and making sure we we uh, you know we we tick off the boxes and make sure that everyone is happy with the data that's come through and that it won't interfere with anything on board. So uh, on board or outside the vehicle. Um, I just want to let everybody know that if you are interested in this conference at all, please go to the ARIS website, ARIS.org, and click on our uh, 40th anniversary tab. You can see all kinds of information on the conference and then also um, uh, the, um, uh, the hotel information and registration information. And that's my spiel on this. So <laughs> uh, let's move back to, all right. Um, all right, so uh, I think where we're at right now is uh, Q&A. And so, uh, Jim, Reed, did you have any questions from the audience? I do have a couple of questions from the audience. Let's start with the one from Aris Ops UK. Did any of the other crew members on STS-9 take an interest in what Owen was doing? And if so, what was their reaction? Yeah, that's interesting, Frank. I'm not sure if you have better any more data than I do, but I, I actually think that on STS-9, I don't know that anybody else used the radio. That being said, I do know that his crewmates uh, thought very positively of it, and some of them who flew again later uh, have used radios, and basically everybody since then has used radios. But I, but I really think that that was on STS-9, that was still very novel. Everybody else had a very tight schedule. Dad had... Uh, planned that into his schedule, which is why he had time to be able to set aside for it. So I think uh, it would have been difficult for others to really pay that much attention to, honestly, much less participate in. Yeah, I, I, I agree with your your assessment there, Richard. Um, let me also say that, um, you know, it over time it built up, you know, your dad was the person that did it. Um, on the next flight, uh, we had Tony England and several others that actually uh, utilize the equipment. And then when we start doing the family contacts, I'll use Bob Parker as an example, because he was one of your dad's crewmates. He used the ham radio system on, on STS-35 uh, uh, during the that, that mission. I know that for a fact. Uh, all, pretty much the, all the crews were talking to, to, to their friends or family as part of it or to a school. So, uh, so there are school walls. And you had your own opportunities with schools. I mean, one of them was Budbrook... Uh, in uh, in the UK, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. you know what, what's interesting too about shuttle versus Skylab. So my other, you know, my dad had two flights. His first flight was Skylab, and during Skylab, uh, NASA had a very different plan, uh, which was still quite interesting. Which is that um, our house uh, uh, that we lived in during both my dad's flights, but for Skylab, we had things put in in my mom's or my parents' bedroom. And in our kitchen, we had squawk boxes put in. Mm -hmm. So any any communications from the Capcom up or, or down from space, we got that we had an unfiltered live feed. And because of that, we actually had NASA come by and give us briefings, even as children. I was the only, you know, 12 years old or something at the time. We would get briefings to say, hey, by the way, you're gonna hear, you know, off nominal situations and things happen all the time. Don't freak out. It's we're gonna work all these problems, but you're gonna hear it raw which I mm -hmm. thought was actually nice that we got to hear that the raw feed. But we also had on my mom's nightstand, a little black bat phone. And I mean, it literally looked like Comm Commissioner Gordon's phone with you could pick up here at dial tone and had a single button in the middle where the rotary would have been. And that button, when you pressed it, it called the Capcom's desk. And if it was one of the approved times, which we had on a piece of paper, 
the Capcom would patch us through to Skylab. And oh, so, really? And so I could actually, I had a sheet of paper to where I knew that if I needed help on my math homework, I it would, and dad was over a ground station and there wasn't already planned communication that I could press that bat phone, it would call to Capcom and I could talk to dad. Uh, but I but I have a suspicion that, like, don't forget, they were up for months. And so I think they, NASA, That's true. You, you can't block your family from having a conversation with their parent for months. Yeah. And so they jumped through hoops to do that. Obviously, for the shuttle, they didn't think that was needed. So they didn't, uh, I don't know of anybody that had the same kind of squawk boxes or the 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 phone there uh, by the time it got around the shuttle. So that's why suddenly the dependency moved over to ham radio. Yeah. And then when, with Mir being a long duration mission, they were relying on ham radio significantly, uh, right. both for, for regular conversations with families and, and, and others, but also for emergency communications, as right. we all know. Um, and, uh, and then on, <clears throat> on, on space station, especially before they put the IP phone on, on board, we were the only way for them for to talk to their, their friends and family. So, uh, so, uh, Jim, you have any other questions? Sure. Uh, I'm going to combine a couple from a couple of hams. A uh, question goes back to uh, Richard. You were talking about the recordings that Owen made. Has there ever been any consideration to putting those online? And similarly, are QSL logs still available for your contacts and for Owen's? Well, you just saw my logs, so the as such as they are. Um, um, and I, I might have my dad's written logs. I do have the tapes. And so uh, I, I'd be very happy to make those available. So maybe that's something we can work on after this is uh, uh, digitizing those tapes. Uh, I think I have a tape recorder that hooks up to an interface to directly to the computer. So I think I actually have that ability myself. But if I don't, I'll, I'll circle back with this group and uh, I'd be very happy to make those, uh, uh, those tapes available publicly. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, Richard, because, um, you know, the historical uh, aspects of this are, are tremendous. And actually, people being able to hear the the audio directly, you know, their own audio, I'll say, or even even little clips and say, oh, that definitely was me, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I agree. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even if they so, weren't logged, you know, even if my dad might not have been able to hear the whole call sign. Yeah. I'd be able to hear their own voice and go like, I did make it through. Yeah, right. Exactly. OK. Uh, Jim, do you have any others? Yeah, I'll do one more. Um, so John Ward asked, what frequencies were used for STS contacts? And maybe you all can talk about frequency coordination a little bit. Oh, gosh, I, I'll talk that. because yeah, I, yeah, I, I did that for for uh, when I was in AMSAT at the time. Um, let me just say that, but before me was Bill Tynan, a W3XO that handled all of that stuff. For shuttle, um, the primary frequency, and if you watch that video clip, was 145.55. And he picked that frequency working internationally to make sure that was a calling uh, frequency in a lot of areas around the world. And it was an open frequency in the United States. Later, we learned that that wasn't as good. And we ultimately, uh, for a downlink, uh, chose uh, uh, 145.80. And that's, um, uh, and then, you know, basically the, the uplink frequencies are all a function of where you are in the United in, in the world, because in the United States you can use certain uplink frequencies and not others, and the same thing in different parts of the world, uh, because the frequencies have all been set up, have been all coordinated locally. There was really not a you know understanding of of you know satellites at the time when that was first done. We have a segment of uh, in in two meters in the in the one forty five megahertz band that's four satellites, but it's very small. You, you can fill it up very quickly. So, uh, so we're, you know, that's, that's basically how we did that. Uh, um, Jim, any others? Um, I'll do two shout outs to wrap it up. One from Rita Carl, who was at the Challenger Center and worked with uh, uh, on Richard's NASA downlink. And prior to that, an Eris contact with Owen and Richard while you were trading in Russia, uh, Richard. And then from Thomas Daniels, he's a ham who got one of those 500 letters because you took the time to uh, to do all the QSLs. And he just wanted to thank you for that. That's awesome. Yeah, nice. To, it's nice to know we're still connected. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll send a shout out for to Ban Dan Barstow, too, because Dan is was also a integral uh, individual working with you on Windows on Earth and, and things like that. So. So I think um, 
Wow, we uh, went a whole hour here, um, and that was fantastic. So I think at this point, uh, um, I want to well, I want to thank everyone for um, attending today's webinar. I particularly want to thank uh, Richard uh, for all of your support. This was this was this was phenomenal. I mean, I always feel that if we can learn something, uh, each one of us, um, that's a fantastic thing. And I've learned some things and I know you have too. And I, I know a lot of people that are listening have done the same thing. So thank you for allowing that to happen. And think about, uh, for those that are in the audience, think about the uh, the 40th anniversary conference. There's, there'll be more to come at that conference and more learning and more excitement. So uh, thank you again, Richard. Thank you all for attending today. And um, as we say in amateur radio parlance, seven threes are best wishes. Take care, everyone.